All right, again, I'm doing my, this is my goodbye to O'Neill. Uh, I want to say I was a fan of O'Neill's work, but I didn't know at the time, because you have to remember, except for when he was editing, I didn't always know it was Danny O'Neill. I, I, you know, I didn't know what one of my favorite Batman writers was Munch. Is it Munch or, I, I don't know. Anyway, until like decades later, because I didn't follow the names. I didn't know who wrote any of this shit till like 80s or so, you know. Like when it became something like, I think Byrne was the first one I finally just realized who was doing this shit. Because it wasn't like omnipresent and everything. You would hear about it here and there. And you find out from, you know, yeah, they find out from the wife where, uh, Dude's hidden at so they can go and save him. Ah, okay. So after Power Man has to fight Captain Planet. <laughs> the power is not his. <laughs> Nor is it yours. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry at all. <laughs> it's a decent story. However, here's where things start to get good. On issue 88, O'Neill actually has some people on drugs. There's a party at the movie theater. Yes, you hung out in a movie theater back then. Not, not a barber shop. Power Man lived in a movie theater in the comics. And the artist actually gives him a much better look where he's just wearing pants and a t-shirt. At no point would I say Luke Cage was ever a, uh, what is the word for it? A fashion guy. Uh, I'm not going to say fashionista because that's what you used to call a female. Uh, so they, and they have the pills and everything. Now keep in mind, uh, the hard run hero thing has already happened at DC that Danny himself wrote. Stan Lee has already done his uh, run on Spider-Man where we find out that Harry Osb Osborne is on drugs. So those two things have already happened and O'Neill himself has already come back to Iron Man. I know he didn't do the original run. It happened after it. That's why I always thought I was always disappointed when I came back and read Demon in a Bottle. Because I didn't read the actual Demon of Balsar, which is a good story. The issues I read were the O'Neill run, so I was always confused why people thought it wouldn't be a good collection. And when I, I was looking forward to it, hoping it, it was like, oh. Because if you actually run the, read the O'Neill run of Iron Man, it's a much better story. He gets a new girlfriend who's kind of an average girl, but she's very smart. Yeah, yeah, I know. Shush. You have to remember the context of the time. The 80s, it's stark and everything. You know, he's like the super handsome, rich asshole guy. And he was kind of still there. He he wasn't the, the uh, Robert Downey Jr. version. But he was close enough for government work. Uh, and he ends up leaving his company again and everything. Uh. Stan takes over and becomes the Iron Monger because that's what I was expecting when I heard Demon in a Bottle. I was expecting the big fight with him and Iron Monger and everything. And Iron Monger tells him about his childhood and everything, and then pulls out the gun and everything. Because he remembers his no, he didn't pull out the gun. He has his like his pulse rate. Like he's fighting Iron Man to a standstill. He can't win, but he hasn't lost yet. And Iron Man is still in the, in the shitty original armor because he's in the old gray armor because he's finally gotten a cured himself of the drugs and him and the girl have built this thing and I think her brother helps he ends up kissing her before leaving he's got this like just grizzly Adams fucking beard shit going on and he's like dropped off the planet Rhodes at this point is Iron Man and is doing a damn good job at any rate so there's that big scene with every yeah but anyway if you read that you can see why this goes well because Danny's again on his past Talking about shit he's gone through, and, uh, 
Power Man's friend D.W., I forget his last name, anyway, it's in here somewhere, has, of course, taken the drugs with him and left. And believe it or not, this is Danny Rand. The guy in this stupid-ass-looking outfit and hat is Danny fucking Rand. <laughs> and he gets... And they both go after the guy, and uh, Mark Silvestri... Excuse me. Yeah, I know, I'm getting them mixed up. Mark Spector is giving him a cab ride in one of his identities, because he had several by the Moon Knight. Then he goes back into his Kung Fu uniform, and they find out the perpetrator of all this, the drug pusher, is Black Mamba. She looks... Or Mariah, Black Mariah, yeah, she looks very different than she did in the TV show. Way less of an interesting character here, I'm sorry. Uh, D.W. Griffin, he goes into this whole spiel about his life, about how he feels like he's going to the bottom. Like he was named after great directors and stuff, because O'Neill captures this guy in a few sentences. Everybody else, he's just kind of been there. D.W. Griffin just kind of, you know, he worked at the movie theater. I guess his parents owned it, and uh, Power Man had his office above the movie theater. And apparently he feels like he's a failure. He has no aim, no ambitions, no existence. And that's why he's sitting there looking at this drug, thinking about it. And he tells all this, not to his best friend Power Man, Luke Cage, not to Danny Rand, not to uh, the Daughters of the Dragon, or anybody who gives a flying shit about him, but some asshole who's drunk in an alley that he just gave a coin to. Nothing against the guy who's drunk in an alley. It's just, this man doesn't know DW from anything. And the whole point of this is that he's kind of given up. He's not going to his support system. He has a fight with his girlfriend, so he thinks he has no one. Even though his best friend and his buddy are out here risking their lives to try to save him, but he doesn't realize it. Because, of course, uh, Iron Fist just mops the floor with the people that, uh... Fudge. Black Mariah is hired because they're just decent kung fu players, but they're not going to be as good as Danny Rand. So the fighting is there, the whole action is there, but that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is watching D.W. Griffin fall apart.